Welcome to the Scale Up Valley podcast, where we bring the best founders, CEOs, and investors to help you scale a business from 1 million to 1 trillion. Today's guest is Colin Carvey, uh, the CEO at Revity. He was also the former senior vice president of growth at Vacasa, a very successful uh, case study that she, we will you will share more uh, about a bit later, uh, both about your company and about your story with Vacas as, as well. I'm glad to announce that this episode is sponsored by the web agency WebTech. WebTech are specialists on getting customers to companies. They are booking 250 meetings a month to their own sales team, and their business strategy is to teach other companies what they do for themselves. I'm really excited to announce that I've agreed with Pontus Linnell, CEO of WebTech, a special advantage to our listeners. Our community have now access to a free design suggestion on how your website could be improved and or free trials for both SEO and digital marketing. Oh, and by the way, we are working with them too and impressed by the results. You can do the same. You just need to go to bewebtech.com slash Mike, bewebtech.com slash Mike, and tell them you are a listener of the show. Now back to the podcast. Well, um, but yeah, let, let's let's start by getting to know more about you, Colin. Please introduce yourself and let us know more uh, how has been your journey and how did you end up uh, starting Revity and uh, and on your way to, to scale it even more uh, in the future? Yeah, no. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for the kind words. And uh, yeah, super excited to be on here and just talk a little bit about, about my story uh, and, you know, kind of the, some of the things I learned along that way as well. So I started and in, in from a startup perspective, like I think I'm a little bit of a unique character in the fact that I started in banking, very boring. Um, I like to say I did a lot of highly funded entrepreneurial work within banking because uh, I did uh, switch jobs about every two years. Um, but yeah, I started, I actually started as a graphic artist and designer, was one of my dream jobs um, and got a job in a bank at the time it was household uh, and just really just managed my way up, uh, kind of made the foray into what I'll call the digital banking world um, through that process and really learned just a ton around how creativity isn't just locked in design, uh, but there is a lot of creativity that's required in business. Um, and I didn't, I didn't realize that, you know, growing up, I think in high school and even in the college days. Right. Um, but I really learned that as I grew up within the banking world. Um, and, and through that, I went into the dot-com space of banking uh, within household and HSBC and really fell in love with more of the business side of business. Um, but, you know, always thinking outside the box, like how do we reinvent? How do we think about a problem differently? Uh, and I think that is really important, especially as you get into startup world is like, how do you think outside the box? How do you try and solve problems? Um, those things can make a huge difference. Through there, I started learning a lot about data and analytics, something I'm very excited about. I went on to work at Capital One, which is very data and analytics centric, and then TransUnion, which is big data. Uh, and again, really focused on the data components and the analytics around how do you try and scale through using um, the resources around you. So part of that being marketing, um, but I also did a stint within fraud identity solution stuff that was, was quite fun at TransUnion. So a lot of variety in my space, um, and, uh, but really started as really centered around that data and analytics. I then went and joined Vacasa. And part of that reason why is because I did, as I moved up within banking, got tired of banging my head against the wall. I truly believe we could have seen like 100% growth, right? And we were doing like, you know, record breaking 25% growth within the division that I managed. Um, it was amazing. It was fun. But like, I'm like, man, it was just like pulling teeth to get us to get even to that 25% when I could see the opportunity being quite significantly larger. Um, and so I, I looked for an opportunity within the startup space. I wanted to do more entrepreneurial stuff, not necessarily my best financial decision, um, but definitely from, <laughs> you know, satisfaction. Coming uh, from the corporate work. world, and especially oh. at that layer, <laughs> the packages yeah, are a yeah. bit different. <laughs> well, a bit different, a bit different. Especially not yeah. again, right? <laughs> it's kind yeah, of two yeah, years yeah. ago, they, they were a bit better. Uh, yeah. kind of in the peak. I, I, and I'm, 
and my on multiple levels too, because it's like banking, right? Like banking pays pretty well, right? And very secure right. type jobs for the most part, right? And then now that I'm was going talking to... about tech after this correction, uh, the tech oh, salaries yeah, yeah, were, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, oh yeah, we're crazy. Even yeah, even yeah. At, at the peak of the tech salaries, maybe the the fits are, are kind of there was still a gap to uh, the banking uh, best times, right? Or, or bad times. <laughs> oh, totally, totally. But but I also say it was vacation rentals like tech which you know in, in in old world of mom and pop where salaries are you know a little bit a little bit suppressed too so yes uh, i think uh, it was it was quite interesting so yeah so then i went and worked eric brought me over he was the founder and ceo of the casa uh, okay. to basically help them scale up when i started there we had about four thousand units um and one of the interesting things is eric talked a lot about unit count uh rather than revenue per asset um, and that was one thing I picked up on quickly is like, how do we try and focus? And it was a good metric to use just as you're thinking about, you know, just growing, growing, growing. But as you think about profitable growth, right, changing that mindset and trying to figure out how do we drive not just units, but the right units and the right. units that can bring revenue. Um, so my team and myself spent a lot of time trying to figure that out. What solutions can we provide to drive growth? Because we had pretty aggressive growth goals. And when I joined, they were all based on unit count because that was the driver. Um, mm -hmm. And how do we try and drive that unit count? Because we had to meet those goals. But at the same time, how do we drive profitability within that unit count? Um, and I think it's really important. One of the things that, you know, I think I learned through my banking world, right, as I grew up, and that is just what matters, right? Um, so I had the ability to have experience and, and, and interact with a lot of very smart people, people who had been through a lot, right? And had seen a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And the things that the thing that I learned was that kind of the three P's, right? Which is people and people matter significantly, right? Uh, they just, right. They, the people are, are super important to any business. Um, they can crush you or they can make you successful. Um, the, the second piece is process, right? How do you think about how you do things? And, and really, that's, you know, a, a, a foray into, into execution, like how well can you execute, right? Because execution becomes so important in business and especially in the startup space. Mm -hmm. um, it's great to have a great idea, but if you can't deliver on the great idea, you, you're never going to be successful. So and, and in my mind, that has a lot to do with process. And in banking, you get way too much process as part of the problem. But there is this balance you can find um, where I think process becomes super important. Um, and then last is prioritization. So especially in, you know, entrepreneurial startup work is what do you work, what you work on matters and where you focus has a significant impact on your business. You're not always going to get that right. And that's okay. Um, but I do think it's super important that you focus on that prioritization. So I think people is the first one. And I think the biggest, I think process and prioritization kind of go hand in hand. Um, I think you have to do both well uh, to really succeed. Yeah. So that's kind of what I took to the casa. I, quickly to help build an amazing team. Uh, my team there just, just absolutely crushed it. Um, and, and one of the, the key things like that I did was I brought teams together. It was, uh, so I had diverse groups. So I had this growth group over here that was doing organic growth. I had a marketing team that was kind of doing marketing and kind of working with the organic team. I had a merchants and acquisitions team that was off doing their own thing. I mean, they were even in a, in a, in a, in a different site in Idaho. And nobody was really cross collaboration, talking to each other, working together. Right. Um, and I, I think, you know, that was one of the things that made us so successful at Picasa was we started as a growth team, really started to work together. Um, so when we started looking at mergers and acquisitions, we were looking at, is that a market we can grow in organically? And then how do we kind of feed those together so that we build process again, back to process, right? How do we build yeah. process so that, we synchronize that. So our marketing is actually going out at the same time that all the news is hitting of an acquisition, right? As an example. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people thought that mergers and acquisitions was our big thing. And that's what we, where we got all our growth from when I was there. Uh, it wasn't the case. We did a ton of them, but you know, it was not, uh, most of our growth actually came from organic growth. And most of it tagged on to this mergers and acquisition strategy of acquire and then go out with your organic growth. Um, and we yeah. found that to be su very successful.
Yeah. And, and let me jump in to, to say for the ones who are listening. So you, you help at Vacasa to, to raise their 390 million Series C. Um, and then you were responsible for 88 mergers and acquisitions uh, producer over who produced over free X growth increased overall units. You were explaining what is unit profitability and, and built a team that continues to serve Vacasa to this day. Uh, and yeah, 88 uh, merger and acquisitions. <laughs> and now I'm looking to your LinkedIn. That's why I'm looking to my my left side for the ones who are watching on YouTube. And you've been there two years and, and one month according to uh, to LinkedIn. So, <laughs> wow. And, and then what I love about it, because it's kind of, yeah, we are doing M&A to accelerate our growth. And what you are telling me, it was really organic growth uh, on top of of an of M and A that were really able to completely you know uh, make a scalable a scalable strategy that that was able to produce such such amazing uh, results. So, what are the lessons learned there that you could share with other founders that maybe are in at this stage or or CEOs or or executives or leadership teams that are at this stage thinking about okay. Maybe we need to start considering M&A. Um, organic growth is great, but maybe there is year opportunity for consolidation, opportunity to grow faster. What they should look to, or and then you can you can relate this with with Vacasa and, and your lessons learned there before we go to Revity, the company that you are uh, that you are a founder and and CEO at, uh, and now starting a company from scratch, which is a, another new adventure. So stay there. It's a different ballgame. Just yes. doing yeah, the, yeah. The, the small <laughs> ad here. <laughs> stay there. We are talking about Vacasa, but still we have another great story after yeah. this. One. <laughs> no, I, I and I think the the M and A story is really interesting, like because. When I came on, um, we were doing large acquisitions, so 400 plus units. If you look at unit count, um, established companies, uh, and what was interesting is we would pay premiums for them, right? Because they were established businesses, they knew what they were worth. Right. And then it would take us years to do integration and cost us a lot of money during that integration. We weren't able to get the returns that we could get on a more smaller company that wasn't quite um, at the same caliber, right? And so you'd pay higher price, you'd get less optimization, and you'd spend more money. Um, and that's what we realized as we went through that process of like, wow, if we go after smaller property managers and acquisitions, so smaller acquisition targets who aren't able to perform, we can get them for less money. Yeah. And because we had a platform that was already established and we knew how to do it, we could integrate them really fast. And like if you went through that process and you lost some customers, it was okay because you didn't overpay for them. On the other side, you you were overpaying, so you had to make sure you retained them. So you'd bend over backwards and have to do tech enablement and all this other stuff to try and accommodate what they were used to. Where the smaller ones, like we could go after them, we'd integrate them right away. We ended up not losing as many customers as we expected. Why? Because we could produce the results. So they have a property manager or, or, or a company, right, that wasn't doing an awesome job. And we were able to retain those clients at a higher rate, even than our organic growth, because you would immediately integrate them and they get higher returns and, and, and they get better, better results. Um, yes. And, and with, that would happen within three months. I mean, my acquisitions team, I went to Zach Monahan on my team. He's, he's amazing. And, uh, and, and Sean Greer, who was also my team at the time. And like I told him, I'm like, what will it take? Because they were like, it's crazy. You can't do that many acquisitions when we were, you know, looking at. It. They're like, it's just nuts. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, and but I said, tell me what it would take. And they came back and again, people, right? This is back to that people thing. They like, this is what I need. And like, you know, I was these back and forths on it, but we figured it out. And uh, and then it was okay, great. And the team created a process by which we can innovate, and then they executed. Um, and they did a, an amazing job. But it was like these smaller ones. Like, it was all about. Okay, integrate them quickly, but we get the benefits of what we already know. Right. Um, and I've talked to, to other folks who have thought about M&A, right? And, and I tell them, I'm like, look, when you're going after M&A, the first thing you want to do is you want to make sure your platform is where you want it to be. So if you're just starting out and you don't feel that way, you overpay. It's okay to overpay. But then you've got something. 
Now you don't want to overpay. You want to find the ones where you can mm. integrate quickly. You want to integrate quickly. And, and this was, I, it's also, I can lean on my experience in banking. I saw this all the time. We'd acquire these companies and we're like, okay, great. We're going to get all these benefits from them. But we're like, well, we can't integrate them for three years. And like, you don't, you don't get all the benefits and times change. And now you're behind the times, right? Where I truly believe that acquiring companies and getting them integrated as quickly as possible helps both the employees that are coming over and mm-hmm. helps you actually gain quickly gain with your clients um, confidence and hey, this is the value we bring and, and they can see that better. What that did, and, and this is the interesting thing that I think was, I don't know, it's it's intuitive when you think hindsight 2020, but I think what we didn't realize is the benefits of that actually fueled all our granite growth. Because what happened is people started talking about us. We go into a market, we'd increase the revenue by 30% just by integrating them into our platform, sometimes 60%, right? Now, guess what? They're going to talk about us. So their neighbors thinking about managing an asset, they're going to talk about Picasa. And guess what we're going to do is we're going to make sure we're in front of all those neighbors More than uh, so that they also... Yeah. So they also see us. And that's that's what ended up working, I think, really well for us and helped fuel our, our overall growth. So. That's that's super impressive because there is kind of display for the ones who are in the m a space. Sometimes you don't need to do a lot. You just need to kind of buy two or three companies uh, that are smaller that no investor or no PE firm is looking for kind of the, you know, the under 1 million or even the under 3 million in EBITDA. And, and then you integrate them all together. Sometimes you even don't need to merge them. You just have kind of a, a set of free companies in the same space. And then you say, okay, now I have a 3 million or 5 million EBITDA company that becomes interesting for a P uh, firm. So, and, and done, right? But here it's, it's even, it's much different, right? So it's, it's about how can I buy cheaper uh, how can i implement my scale up framework as quickly as possible in that company and how can i grow that portfolio of companies that i'm acquiring so the group will uh keep growing uh fast uh, that's exactly right it, it, it's the leverage of that right and how do you leverage yeah. that acquisition to get you more growth uh, i think is is a really interesting piece right and i think that was part of what we discovered through that process Right. But there is also the um, kind of the discussion and kind of the, um, you know, the ones who will get, can't we get distracted? Can't we increase too much the complexity? Shouldn't we focus more on the core of of the business? Um, so I think that at a certain point, and this related with your third P that I love, which is very aligned with, with what I use, the people execution strategy, use the people process prioritization. Um, I think on on the on the third layer, the prioritization of the focus, uh, you will have this pushback. The ones who want to explore and that want to get out and that want to test new things, and the ones would would be much more conservative and would say, "Oh, let's let's double down our resources on what is working at this stage." But then you will have the discussion now from the innovators would say, "If you keep doing that, this will be able. This will grow less and less and less because uh, there is a, a time uh, limit, and the, what, the other ones will come. Oh, the time is is huge, so so you, you should stay here, right? So there is still so much to to conquer from a market share perspective. Uh, did you have this kind of discussions yeah. at the executive team level, and how did you handle this discussion that that I'm that I can see happening in any executive team? I think that that's useful for the ones who are listening. How do you handle your yeah. internal stakeholders to have them on board to implement your M and A strategy and your skill? Yeah, I mean, here's strategy. Yeah, I'll tell you how how we thought about it and how I think about it even to this day. Right, is is what I call daisy chain. How do you daisy chain into things? Right, how do you move from you're very good at this. How do you just slightly expand that? And I use the simplest conversation on that is when with Vikasa and you're doing M and A is where do you expand to? Right. So I'm not going to go to, for example, we didn't buy a lot of companies in the Northeast because they had these off seasons where you had to charge these management fees, and we didn't have a practice of doing that. We didn't know how to do that. These management fees that were off season, where the house wasn't occupied, like we didn't have the system set up to do that. We didn't have the process of how to do that. I'll also say, like at the time, 
we weren't great at managing two and a half million dollar homes. So we didn't go after companies that were managing two and a half million dollar homes. So we didn't, there was a lot of decisions made around how do we narrow the scope of where we go, but we did start expanding into what we call regulated states, something that wasn't really the case before. A little more complicated, but when we get that customer, the process for us is the same. There's legal stuff we had to cover. There's you know different things we had to do and set up some systems to support that. But our core business at the core of what we could deliver didn't change. And so our ability to be successful was much, we weren't much more confident in our ability to be successful. Yes, we had to check some boxes and yes, we had to expand a little bit and do some tech, but we knew at the core, it supported what we were good at. Um, And I think that's super important when you're thinking about business, right? Like, what is my core? What am I really good at? And if I'm looking at a merger and acquisition, does it completely is totally different? Like, I think that's much harder. And I think that's much riskier. But does it take what I have and expand it just a little bit and complement what I'm doing? I think that's a much better decision. And I think that that daisy chain, another example is that we were international, right? At Vicasa and and Mm -hmm. at at our senior team, we sat down about that and like US market share is huge. Like we don't need to do that. And Vicasa had, and like, so we, we withdrew. We pulled back from being as international as we were to really focus again and prioritize where the TANS in the US was great. Like go after that. And once we conquer that, go somewhere else. And the strategy, at least at the time was, okay, great. We can do that. And then we can go after Mexico because our owners visit Mexico often and they can own a Mexico. So expanding there makes sense, right? So you can, again, that daisy chain of how do I expand where my core business is already somewhat successful. Um, And and to me, that's important. A lot of startup guys get bored with what they're doing, right? Um, And I'm learning that myself. (laughs) Um, I think it's important to check yourself a little bit to like keep within your strengths, right? Yeah. And in, in a certain way, it's it's really important to not only stay focused on, on your core business, but also to ensure that your MA strategy is focused and completely aligned with the core of, of the business. So you can also get distracted in your own MA thesis. And if it is not aligned with 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 the core business, you are trying to again reinvent the wheel, do stuff that you are not competent uh at. If you are just replicating in other companies what you are doing in your own business because you are an expert, you tested the model, then uh, things make much more sense. Yeah, and especially if you go down the strategy that we went down, right, which was using it to increase organic growth, then you got to know that you can do that and you should do something that you've been successful at. So. Absolutely. Uh, and yes, especially in that kind of industry, sometimes you start kind of acquiring companies in business, uh, in, in, in verticals that you don't understand, businesses that you don't understand, right? So which, which makes the process much more complex if you are trying to create a conglomerate and diversify that, that conglomerate. So then maybe you get into construction or into real <laughs> estate and to food and beverage and so, or retail. And yeah, and, and then that's the, the typical conversation about guys, maybe we are trying to do too many things because we might be able to find CEOs who are experts or GMs who are experts in the different companies. But then at the end of the day, at the board level, we have limited capacity to, to understand what are we doing from a portfolio uh, strategy uh, perspective, right? But let's go to, to Revity. So 2019, uh, you start uh, Revity. So let, let us know more about why, what is Revity about? Where, where are you in terms of stage of growth? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, Revity was post-Vicasa. One of the things I realized at Vicasa uh, with the teams that I had and what we built is that short-term rentals were an investment asset class that was really under under recognized as an asset class and and still to this day. Uh, and so when I when I left the Casa, that's what I set out to do is like define short-term rentals as the investment class that I believe they should be. Uh, but that is a lot of work, right? That's a lot of groundwork. Um, you look at long-term rent, you look at multifamily; those have become institutionalized, right? Those are true investment asset classes. And yet short-term rentals are overlooked from that perspective. Uh, hotels, like a hospitality aspect, um, that is an investment asset class, right? Um, where yeah. short-term rentals are not looked at as that. And so our, what I started Revity to do is to help define that and help create that space. 
and what we what we started with, and one of the things again, data analytics background in the financial services is the data and the problem with the data today in short term rentals. Most of the data has is scraped. It has a ton of assumptions. Uh, it's like I call it, it's like averaging out, you know, a, a Motel Six against a Ritz Carlton. It's exaggeration for the point, but you get the point. Um, and so we set out and built the data. So the, the first two days, and I knew we were going to, it was going to take time for us to do that. Uh, so we really set out the first two years, just learning the data. What What is the data sources that are out there? How do we use it? How do we learn from it? And how do we build up, you know, our own um, proprietary view on it and, and data sets on it? Uh, and so that was the first two years is really doing that. And we had some clients that we brought in to help sustain that um, and keep that going. Um, but really focused on that and not focused necessarily on the growth. Um, you know, I had the luxury of being able to do that, which is amazing. Um, thanks to all the support I get, but uh, you get the point. It was, it was great. And uh, you know, we, we really did build that out at that point. I realized that, okay, great. I think we're ready. I think we understand this space enough. Mm-hmm. How do we, how do we expand beyond that? And what is needed to try and help? And we had experimented with some investors. How do we get these investors over the hump to, you know, feel more comfortable, right? We have mm-hmm. data. What we realized is that process, right? Come back to that second word, right? Which is right. they need a process by which to deploy the capital. Um, and so it was, it was interesting. I, I brought in a, a co-founder who had, you know, um, and she's, she's amazing. Uh, and she had a lot of experience within tech travel and private equity. Uh, and so mm-hmm. she came in, um, she's my co-founder now, and uh, she brought that viewpoint. And we spent about a year really trying to figure it out and solve for it. Um, and really, you know, I mean, we we had some, at one point, we just had this revelation of like, it's this end-to-end solution. That's what we're providing you. We're helping you understand the data. You want to know what market you can go in? Great. It uses our data and our insights. You can get that. You want to acquire the asset. We have an acquisition team that has experience in acquiring short-term rentals, like, which is not that often yeah. that you find that, right? And then like, great. Now we need to design it. Great. We have an amazing team that can go do that. And then we can actually help you manage the asset um, post, right? We don't do the property management, right? But we oversee that and provide you data. All of this using the data and insights that we have and that we've developed to help you make really informed decisions along the way. And so we spent time, we built this whole thing out and, uh, you know, launched it and was very well received, right? Um, And then, you know, I don't know, my fault for not like look deep, diving deeper into the short uh, the the long term rental communities we realized that there were people that had done exactly what we did but in the long term space with almost the same process it was really interesting to me um wow. it was complimentary and 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 I'm like well great we were on the right track but damn we spent like 3 months working on that thing we should have just gone to their <laughs> site um, but i think it was it was really reassuring and it, it you know it's not a competitive thing because their ability to get into short term rentals would be extremely tough yes. just because again of the data that we've built up over the years and the experience that we have short term rentals is a complex space um, and that's what we did is we simplified that so an investor can come to us and say i want to invest here's my checks we can go and deliver results um, with pretty good returns um, and much better returns than you can get with long-term rent or even with multifamily in most cases. Um, so yeah, that's, and, and we've evolved from there. Like now we've, you know, partnered with the likes of Marriott to like build um, people call them star reports for hospitality. Um, we're basically built that for the short-term rental space. So we'll work just with the developers on like what they should build uh, how many units they should build that should be short-term rentals. Mm-hmm. Or we'll take an existing multifamily building and we'll do a study on it to say, based on the data, here's how many units you should convert to short-term rentals to to, to basically maximize your returns um, from a multifamily building um, okay. by you know doing what I call you know multi-use, right? Part of it can be short-term rentals uh, and you can get higher returns from that. Would you say it's kind of an enterprise Go to market motion at this stage, or more mid market uh, go to market motion, or both. It's it, it's interesting. It's both. Like I mean, the the idea is, you know, we work with you know large institutional capital, um, and we're starting to work with some of those folks, which is great. Um, but they're still it's still very early in the space. It's, it's a huge opportunity, uh, and so we've been working with you know the likes of family offices um, and and those kind of folks because. Right they have the capital to go deploy in the space and are willing to do it. 
And the great thing is, is that those folks with, you know, 10 million, $20 million that are willing to go get it now are ahead of the game. Their ability to sell it then when institutions comes in, this is what happened in the SFR space, right? The short term, the, the, the long term rate space, the institutional capital will be willing to pay. They'll be willing to pay for those assets and they'll be willing to pay for those assets plus the business. Um, and right. so there's a real opportunity now for folks with even, you know, smaller folks who can go get 10 million in assets um, and are, are willing to do that, whether they're leveraging their current assets, whether they're selling their current assets, whatever that might look like. Uh, and we work with, you know, I'll call them retail type folks, right? Um, but mm-hmm. folks that really want to build up portfolios for that reason. Right. And, and would you say that the, the clients need to go to the platform and do their own research or it's kind of you provide the service where you leverage it's a service enabled tech organization uh or it's it's really a tech platform where clients go there directly and and, and use the platform to take to extract their information yeah, it's it's definitely service enabled tech right so we do a lot of hand holding um, we do give access to the platform so that they can see it it just makes it more efficient for them and more effective for us um some clients never go to it right they want us to send them the assets and we review it with them and right. Um, you know, it's basically these family offices, right? That want to go through the process and want us to really manage it for them. They'll still select homes and we'll help them give them the data to make very informed and smart decisions. Um, but, but you know, other folks want very much want to see the platform and want hands on and they want to be able to submit stuff on their own and um, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. So it's a, it's a combination, but very tech enabled platform. Right. Sure just a quick question there before we go to the to the final part mm-hmm. of the show, uh, which is typically with this kind of businesses, some investors have some issues understanding how much they are a tech business, a tech business or a, a services business. Did you find this kind of uh, need to explain investors to educate investors on how much revenue is coming from services and how much revenue is coming from from the the core and I guess product or tech it's probably key to help you understand like we're self-funded so i don't have the investors that you're talking about that's that a good point go. oh <laughs> much <laughs> better sorry. i talked to, so I talk talk to myself you, and you my partner to about yourself it. as the shareholders right <laughs> myself <laughs> and the partner is the shareholders so it's uh, all know, we have it uh, so far we have yeah we have one one angel investor that's a, a good friend of mine and he he gets it he gets it really well so um yeah i think um we uh, we we're, we're lucky from that perspective. Um, in, in that, right. I I think you know what what I would say is price. like yeah. tech tech evaluations get much larger evaluations, right? Um, yeah. The great thing that I see through the through what we're creating is our ability to do that. Um, so our scalability and what we're creating allows us to to scale um, a, as a tech much closer to that tech side than the service side um, because the data is so important. There's a lot of self service elements in this business. Right. Um, et cetera. So, and, you know, I, I am still a believer in the democratization. So as we build this for institutional capital, and that's what we've built is an institutional grade. Like we actually grade the assets at institutional level, um, our ability to offer some of those services, even to the greater population, there's no reason why we shouldn't. Um, you just have yeah. to do it at scale as a tech platform. Right. So you have been an executive in the very, in a company that have raised a lot of capital with been yeah. growing like crazy. So now I can see a different pace, a different philosophy that we see nowadays, a lot of kind of two profiles of founders nowadays, the ones, maybe the ones who started in the bootstrapping mode and then go to the VC mode and then the opposite, the ones who start with the VC mode and then I want to do something bootstrap it. I want to do something profitable, sustainable, um, and I don't want to be kind of reporting to a board uh, every single quarter and needing to explain if I want to do something a bit more long term, because then I will not be able to raise the next round. I will not have the milestones. So maybe the business will go away. In this case, I have options. So I can uh, really make decisions about the long term and the mid term and do the right do the right thing for the customer, the right thing for the business because I don't have a lot of shareholders to to manage. So what what's next for you? Is is it do, would you like to get to hyper growth mode? Would you like to have a much more profitable lifestyle uh, kind of business? What, what's next for for Revity and what is your philosophy yeah. in that, that aspect? 
Yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, philosophy is like, I think the last couple of years, especially the last year has been really challenging on the, on the capital raise front and very in the real estate space that we're in, right. And in short-term rental space that we're in a lot of volatility. Right. And we didn't feel based on the market conditions and those two factors, we knew we needed flexibility, right? And we had a lot of conversations about this. We need, we knew we needed the flexibility to make decisions, um, to to pivot where we needed to. And I, I think we're, me and my co-founder, are, I think, are super glad we did that. I think it was the right decision um, to not do that. We're at the point now. We're like, okay, great. We we know who we are, and it's so cool. The, the journey we went through was so amazing. And you can talk to anybody on my team. Again, people, right? I believe very much in people, and my team's amazing. Um, but we went through this journey where we discovered, kind of, in the last couple of years, discovered who we were. Right? Kind of knew who we were. And that was amazing. But then we discovered what we did. Right? <laughs> like those two things were came differently and at different times. And then we mm-hmm. figured out the process by which we could deliver that. And then we started testing it and improved it. Right? And and got to tune it. And so now we're at this stage where we're growing, and it's all about growing and accelerating all the information we gathered and all the data resources we have, which is great. Our you know who we are being identified. Our what we do being identified. And now actually in practice and proven, um, I think that's a good time. And the capital markets, I think, are starting to shift. Um, so I do think we'll, we'll look at how do we scale and how do we scale pretty quickly? Because uh, I just think there's there's just so much opportunity in this space. Um, and we're just so far ahead of anybody else in looking at this asset class as a true asset class. Yeah. Our plan, our plan is the scale. And that's, that's what we're starting to explore. Right. I like to see this kind of business that we had several CEOs and founders on the show where sometimes they even took kind of a decade to get to a stage. Then then in three years, they got from, you know, five, 10 million to an hundred million. So it was, but it was needed, the refining the model, refining the business model, understanding very well, having all the components leaking and then it seems kind of oh it was easy it, it was not there was an investment of a lot of time and then it also not happens what happens with a lot of vc packet companies they implode because they were not prepared to scale and they were not prepared to scale at that pace of growth that they were forced to to be able to raise uh, to, to be in the game uh to be in the vc game Anyway, we, we could have a full episode uh, yeah. about it. <laughs> and, and, and Mike, I think it also comes back to people because, you know, I got to brag about my team. Like the, the team we have, like everybody knows how to work and work hard and plug away. And that's amazing, right? And that's gotten us to where we are. And that's just been amazing. Um, you know, and I think that will continue to grow and the team will continue to change and grow. And it's, it's good. It's, I think it's good for the company. Um, but yeah, the, awesome. the, the, the amazing team we have has allowed us that luxury because they've been flex, uh, amazingly flex, right? Because, you know, there's always these promises when you get into these startups of great, we're going to go get the billion dollar, $2 billion valuation. Um, and this team is, is, is stuck with it, even though that's not what we went and what we've gone and, and, and done. And that part of that's just their belief in what we have. And part of that is just people and the, the people we have are, uh, we're a team. And that's, that, I think that's super important. It's the, the magic of, of startups and, and scale ups, as I like to call them. So let, let's go to the last segment of the show where we kind of have your quick question and answer uh, rhythm. So, if you'd have the opportunity to have a coffee with yourself in 2019 when you started Revity, what advice would you offer to your younger self? Yeah, when I started this, uh, I think... Or even if you want to go... No, it's hard like because... Or Vacasa or... Yeah, uh, well, what's, what's interesting what is, best you know, for you? <laughs> what, what I've changed is I've become more of a realist, right? Um, I'm not sure I would change that because I'm not sure I would have done what I would have did. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> I've never the started skill of folly. So, <laughs> <laughs> what I know. <laughs> if I knew what it would take, I wouldn't have done it. And I don't know that that's a yeah. good thing because I'm happy with where we're at. But yes, I think that's the one thing that popped in my head is I 
would have told myself to be more realist, maybe, but then I wouldn't have done it. So, and we wouldn't be here. So keep going, yeah. believe in yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> when, it's, right. when you get here, it's... you'll be grateful, but <laughs> just keep going, keep dreaming. Just keep going. That's, that's what I should have told them. Just keep going. Keep the dream alive. That's right. That's it. What are you the most proud of on your journey so far? Yeah, the team. Uh, you'll hear me say that over again. And I, that's the same yeah. thing at Vicasa. It's just the yeah. team is just it's incredible, incredible. Absolutely. Worst advice ever received? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> um, it, it it's might actually be good advice. It's never work I don't, or I don't, this M&A thing, know. you are completely no. crazy. <laughs> that's, I, that's all normal. That's all normal. This is back in my, this is back in my banking days where someone once said, oh, well, the higher you up, the more you can golf. That was never true for me. And I think it was actually <laughs> bad advice to like, you know, watch, you know, their career versus other people's career who went and worked. I don't, I don't think that's the right, I don't think that's the right mantra. Don't, don't, don't necessarily work so you can go play. Um, find, find joy in the work you're doing. Exactly. Favorite, now the resources, your favorite book, it can be business or non-business, you, you decide. Oh, my favorite book. It's a hard one. Um, well, I'll, I'll tell you my favorite book growing up was Treasure Island because I love adventures. I love adventures. And uh, I always, I always, I always uh, dreamed of even being, a, even being lost on an island and then learning how to survive on an island on my own. So um, I, I'd, get very, I'd get very, <laughs> I'd get very, I'd get very, yeah, I know, right? Exactly. I get very lonely because I, I do like people. And, uh, you know, I talk a lot about people and team because it is super important to me. So I think that's probably the thing I'd miss if I was on an island. But yeah, I think, you know, that's probably a good, good book just because of what it represents for me. You'll find a set of people or animals around the islands. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. I would too. That, would, that, is, that is not far off. Like we'd become a team with the bear. Right. <laughs> Amazing. Favorite movie or series? Um, it's the, uh, Justified I, on, on FX. Like I love Justified. I don't know why. I just love the character. Um, very good acting. Um, from my perspective, it's a little gruesome, um, so I don't let my 11 year old daughter view it. But uh, that was that was one of my favorites. So. That's awesome. And finally, your favorite podcast, excluding this one. Oh man, I don't do a lot of podcasts, so you're putting me on the spot there. Okay. Um, I, you're, you're, you scale, yeah. I gotta go with scale just because I'm on. So <laughs> the remedy podcast that we haven't done yet. No, we haven't done yet. I don't know. 319 <laughs> episodes. I will accept the answer. That that's, that's, true. Amazing. <laughs> that's a lot. Good, good, good work. Good work. Excellent. Colin, congrats for your journey so far. All the best for for Revity and all the best for your team and yourself. And let's stay in touch. Thanks for making the time to share your Thank journey you. with us. Pleasure. Thank you. And to our community, thanks for being there. We keep bringing you the best of the best to make your life a little bit easier as you scale up your company. See you soon and keep scaling.